911? Uh, there's been a murder. There's three people dead that I can see right now. Inside? I just came up. She works with me. Inside the house? Yes. What do you see? There's a baby and a man and a woman, and she's my best friend. <laughs> You just heard the voice of Linda Teal calling 911 to report the murder of the three people that lay before her, one of which was her best friend, Judy Anderson. What she didn't know was that what she was seeing at the moment was only the beginning of the horrors that took place in that home on Christmas Eve 2007. Welcome back to Crime A to Z, where we detail cases and criminals from their very beginning until well after other reporting ends. Today we'll be talking about the Christmas Eve Carnation murders. This case is so senseless, it will honestly make you wonder what pulses through the veins of these types of criminals. As usual, you'll see the rainfall that represents our team's tears when we get to those points where the sadness is too extreme for words. Covering over just one square mile of land, the small town of Carnation, Washington is a rural town just east of Seattle with a population of about 2,000 people. It's where married couple Wayne and Judy Anderson had been happily living since the early 1980s, with Wayne working as an engineer at Boeing and Judy a postal worker for the U.S. Postal Service. They were both respected in the small town, with Judy, in particular, known for always being friendly to everyone she met. In 1978, Wayne and Judy welcomed the birth of their baby girl, who they named Michelle Kristen. The couple would also have two other children, an older son named Scott, and another daughter named Mary. Michelle attended Cedar Crest High School in Duval, Washington, where she graduated in 1997. A former classmate described Michelle as having been an artistic, sweet girl who typically hung out with the unpopular kids. Back then, Michelle would share with classmates that she had a volatile relationship with her parents. She'd claim that her father hit her, and that her mother was mean to her and didn't understand her. Later investigation into her claims of abuse and mistreatment would show nothing of the sort and that she enjoyed a relatively standard upbringing. In contrast, Michelle always spoke lovingly of her older brother Scott, with a classmate recalling that he was the only one that Michelle really trusted since they had, presumably, went through their abusive childhood together. Sometime around 2002, Michelle met Joseph McEnroe, both 29 years old at the time, through an online dating site. Acquaintances described Joseph as a little bit weird. They said he would regularly talk about how his spirit guide would tell him how to live his life. He was also diagnosed with severe anxiety, for which he was supposed to be taking medication and attending counseling, but couldn't afford to do either. Once Joseph and Michelle began dating, they were inseparable, with Joseph promptly moving to Washington to live with Michelle in a mobile home park. While the couple was reclusive and didn't have any friends outside of their relationship, the strange and volatile nature of their relationship was clear even to outsiders. Neighbors, classmates, and family members found the couple to be paranoid and unstable. They had blacked out the windows on their trailer and thought people were out to get them. One neighbor stated. They said numerous times that they feared for their lives. They felt that they only had each other, that they could only trust each other. Michelle would often tell neighbors that her parents had a lot of money, but that she and Joseph were always struggling and really poor. And they noted how Michelle was clearly the one in charge in the relationship, with Joseph looking up to her, and Michelle even answering questions that were posed to him. Neighbors would also regularly overhear the vicious shouting matches coming from the couple's trailer, with one neighbor remembering a particular argument where Michelle was yelling at Joseph. You have no job, you have no money, you have no life. They'd live in that motorhome park until 2006, when their financial struggles would force them to move into a motorhome on Michelle's parents' property in Carnation. Then just one year after that, the unthinkable would happen. It was Christmas Eve 2007, and Wayne and Judy had invited their three children, Michelle, Scott, and Mary, along with their families, over for dinner. 
That would include Michelle and Joseph, and Scott and his wife Erica, along with their two children, five-year-old Olivia and three-year-old Nathan. Mary decided not to attend because she was sick, and her son would also not be attending as he'd be spending the evening with his dad, Mary's ex-boyfriend. Michelle and Joseph were the first to arrive that evening. Prior to their arrival, the couple had carefully armed themselves with the handguns they had purchased from a pawn shop months earlier, and then they drove the short distance from their trailer to their parents' front door. Going through Michelle's mind was the vow that she had made to herself and subsequently convinced Joseph to take part in. The vow was that if her family didn't start showing her respect by December 24th, she would kill them all. They entered the home, and Joseph joined Michelle's mother in a back room where she was wrapping Christmas gifts for her grandchildren who would be arriving later that evening. In another part of the home, Michelle was with her father and at some point attempted to shoot him, but apparently missed. Then her gun jammed. Hearing the shot, Judy and Joseph ran into the room where Joseph then completed what Michelle couldn't, shooting her father Wayne in the head, killing him. Terrified, Judy began to scream, so Joseph shot her, and she fell to the floor. When she continued to scream, Joseph apologized to her, and then shot her again, this time in the head, silencing her screams forever. With Michelle's parents now dead, the couple cleaned up the mess from the carnage, then laid in wait for Michelle's brother Scott and his family. When they arrived, Michelle confronted her brother. Seeing she had a gun, Scott charged at her and they struggled for the gun until Joseph arrived and pried Scott away. He'd later note that Scott fought for his life, but was not able to defend himself against their weapons. Michelle shot and killed him. She then shot Erica twice. But even though wounded, the strong, determined mother was still fighting to protect her children. She climbed over the couch to try calling for help. Erica reached the cordless phone and managed to dial 911. The 911 operator answered, but she only heard screaming and could not get the person on the other end of the line to respond. Just 10 seconds after the call was connected, Joseph grabbed the phone from Erica's hand and ripped out the batteries. Joseph then allowed a terrified Erica to momentarily huddle with her young children before he shot her, point blank, in the head. With Michelle's brother and his wife out of the way, Joseph turned to their three and five-year-old children and senselessly murdered them. Following standard police protocol, two return calls were placed to the number, both of which went to voicemail. A dispatch request was made to send police to the scene, albeit six full minutes after the 911 call was placed. They arrived at the home's front gate at the end of the driveway, which the murderous couple had taken care to lock. And apparently that was just enough of a deterrent for the police to move along and not investigate any further. They officially reported, gate is locked, unable to gain access. It would be two full days that the Anderson family's bodies lay, with no concern. On Wednesday, December 26th, when normally punctual Judy failed to arrive at work, her co-worker and her best friend went to her home to check on her. After easily gaining access to the home by simply walking past the locked driveway gate, the pair would encounter what no one should ever have to. 911. Uh, there's been a murder. There's three people dead that I can see right now. Inside? I just came up. She works with me. Inside the house? Yes. What do you see? There's a baby and a man and a woman, and she's my best friend. Police swarmed the property, and the investigation was underway. At some point during their search, Michelle and Joseph, surprisingly, returned to the scene. They would share with police a bizarre story about stealing away to Las Vegas to get married, then changing their mind, then returning home to get a wallet, then returning home again to get fruit. Police separated the couple to question them individually. They found it odd that throughout the questioning, Michelle had never once inquired about why the home was swarming with police. So the detective asked her if she knew why all the police were there at the home. 
Detective Tompkins began asking Michelle Anderson about the fact that she wasn't responding to what was going on around her. The police vehicles, the media trucks, and the helicopters. And Detective Tompkins asked Michelle Anderson, what do you think all these police cars are here for? And she responded, I think the house is on fire. Detective Tompkins asked, whose house? And her response, probably my mom and dad's. Detective Peters asked her, what do you think happened? Two times she said, I don't know. I don't know. And then she said, my dad, my dad might have had a heart attack. Detective Tompkins mentioned to her that law enforcement doesn't usually show up in that much force for a reported heart attack. By this point, the detectives were highly suspicious of Michelle's bizarre story about eloping in Las Vegas, as well as her lack of curiosity about the incredibly concerning scene at her home. So they pushed, ever so slightly. At 11.58 a.m., during that conversation, Detective Tompkins asked the defendant, would you ever harm your family? And she replied, no. That, too, was a lie. Detective Peters then asked her in a voice so faint that it almost sounds like a whisper. She said, I think you might know a little bit more about why we're here. You have to talk to Scott and I about that. And Detective Tompkins at that point says on the tape, Michelle, let me tell you a couple of things we're really good at. But he didn't complete the sentence because Michelle Anderson at that point blurted out, it's my fault. When she was asked what happened, she simply said, I'm sorry. And over the course of the next couple of hours, the detectives learned not only what happened, but they also learned why it happened. Police received full confessions from both Michelle and Joseph. Due to delays resulting from the ever-changing death penalty laws in the state, it would take seven full years before Michelle and Joseph's trials would make it to court. Both before and during the trials, the details of the killings and their motive were all brought to light. The first thing that Michelle Anderson said when she was asked what happened was this, quote, my brother owes me a lot of money, unquote. I just wanted back the money he took from me. Michelle told police that she had lent her brother Scott money and that he hadn't paid it back. She also shared that once Scott married Erica, the once close relationship she used to share with her brother began to crumble. Michelle was also angry at her parents, since they'd recently started pressuring her to pay rent for the trailer that she and Joseph were living in on her parents' property. Once the pair completed the murders, they had planned to escape to Canada, but then indecisively decided to return to the crime scene and pretend to discover the bodies. During Joseph's trial, more heartbreaking details about the brutal slayings were revealed. Court records show that Joseph made sure to mention that he apologized to Erica after she pleaded with him not to shoot her, saying, You don't have to do this. Joseph recalled how he looked at her and said, Yes, we do. No, we love you. We, you don't have to do this. I'm sorry, Erica. I shot her first so she wouldn't have to watch her own children die. Joseph then approached three-year-old Nathan because he was the closest one to him. And when he did, the innocent young boy made an offering to Joseph. Yeah, he had actually showed, held up the phone battery and showed it to me like he understood and accepted what was going on. As Nathan offered Joseph the batteries that he'd previously ripped from the phone, Joseph shot the boy in the head. Joseph then shot the last remaining victim, five-year-old Olivia, in the head, at very close range. Joseph explained, I didn't want them to turn us in. The couple was tried separately, with Joseph's trial beginning before Michelle's, since hers was still being delayed due to her questionable mental competency to stand trial. Joseph's trial began in December 2014, with his defense team arguing that Joseph was mentally ill and that he was bullied by his girlfriend into killing her family. And there was no shortage of twists during the trial, with Joseph presenting himself with a very different, much softer voice than the previously deep voice that he'd spoken with during his pre-arrest interviews. When questioned about it, Joseph explained to the jury that he's been working on having a voice that is more pleasant. 
Later Joseph would develop a convenient twitch that only seemed to surface when he was on the stand in front of the jury. Mr. Merrick, would you agree with me that you have a pretty strong motive? Is the twitch back? It's not really gone away. So. Well, let me ask you something, Mr. Macaulay. It seems not to be as apparent for the jury is not in the room. Is there a reason why? Objection. Counsel testified. I will call a witness to that effect. I'll sustain the objection and move on. Mr. Macaulay, let me ask you to this way. Do you have the twitch when the jury is not in the room? Probably not as much. And uh, is it because you're in stress now? This is a very stressful thing, yes. Also, when I'm coming up here, you know, it's when I'm anticipating to be coming up here, that is stressful. Mr. Mack, would you agree with me that perhaps one of the most stressful moments of your life was when you sat down in Detective Pavlovich's part? Yes. And you were interviewed by him? Yes. Nowhere in his note does he ever note that you ever had a twitch, does he? Mr. Mack, would you agree with me that you have a pretty strong motive to lie to this jury? No. Well, you've lied throughout this case, have you not? Such as? Have you or have you not? There are some cases where I lied, yes. In March 2015, despite the theatrics, Joseph Thomas McEnroe was found guilty of aggravated first-degree murder on all six counts. In May of the same year, he was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences, without the possibility of parole, narrowly averting the death penalty. It was an 8-4 to four vote in favor of the death penalty, short of the unanimous verdict needed for the death penalty to be handed down. Given the outcome of Joseph's sentencing, the district attorney and prosecutor decided to take the death penalty off the table for Michelle. From the time Michelle was arrested, she always maintained her guilt and responsibility in the murders, despite her defense team's attempts to get her to plead not guilty or declare her unfit to stand trial, both of which were attempts to help her avoid the death penalty. During a 2008 jailhouse interview with the Seattle Times, Michelle stated that she is guilty of the slayings and deserves to be executed. I need to be executed for everything that I've done. Deciding that I want to die was the most difficult decision I've ever had to make, and I was able to make it without a second thought because I know what I've done and I want to take responsibility for it. She even refused to talk with her defense team for five straight years because they wanted her to be diagnosed by a psychiatrist. Once Michelle's trial commenced and ultimately concluded, the jury would come to the same verdict as Joseph's. Guilty on all six counts of aggravated first-degree murder. And she too was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Joseph McEnroe is currently imprisoned in the Washington State Penitentiary, and Michelle Anderson is serving out her sentence at the Washington Correction Center for Women. While we're typically able to uncover unreported and little-known post-sentencing facts about criminals from our research, connections, and networks, there has surprisingly been very little activity from either of these two criminals since they were sent to prison. Both prisons the pair were sent to offer standard U.S. prison accommodations and training and educational opportunities, so we do know that there are no noteworthy scenarios they're likely to encounter or endure. There are, however, other noteworthy prisoners who have been imprisoned at those same facilities. Michelle's prison was also prison to Mary Kay Letourneau, the level 2 sex offender and former school teacher who pleaded guilty in 1997 to two counts of rape of a child, her 12-year-old student. Letourneau was released in 2004, married that former student, separated from him, and passed away in 2020 from colorectal cancer. Notable inmates at Washington State Penitentiary, where Joseph is imprisoned, include Robert Lee Yates, the Washington serial killer who actually worked at the prison prior to his imprisonment. And Jack Owen Spillman, the serial killer known as the Werewolf Butcher. Both men continue to serve their life sentences. Just like Michelle Anderson and Joseph McEnroe. Thank you for sticking with us through this sad and senseless case. 
We hope we did justice to all the Anderson family members whose lives were so maliciously and unexpectedly taken from them. This case was definitely a disturbing one. But one aspect we debated about was how Michelle's defense team fought so hard to have her deemed unfit to stand trial in order to save her from the death penalty. This, even though every bit of our investigation revealed complete clarity on Michelle's part about her role and responsibility in the murder and that she was comfortable with the death penalty as her fate. What do you think? Do you have issue with attorneys fighting to save their client from the death penalty when it's what the client wants? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And if you want to see more videos like this one, please be sure to hit like and definitely hit subscribe so you never miss a single video.